Hello, uh, I have wanted to do this for some time. I wanted to show you how to make the front knob for a plane, or it could be a door handle, or it could be a handle for a tool, or something like that. And 90% of these things, 99% of them, would be made on a lathe. But I wanted to show you a method for making it by hand. Now I'm not going to pretend for one minute that it's as fast as using a lathe. There is no question. This is a lot more tedious and, uh, tedious and time demanding. But we don't always choose the easy passage, do we? We sometimes want the challenge. And this will be something of a challenge. But I believe in you. And I believe you can do it. So we're going to be making the, the, knob, the front knob for the plane. And I've got a, a blank of wood that starts out square, rectangular, along its length. And uh, I'm going to show you how to do it. But to first start out, we need to have a template that follows the shape of the, the knob itself. So we've got to, we've got to cut this shape and uh, make it. And I need to show you how to make that. So that's the first thing I'm going to show you. I've got my blank piece of, piece of plastic. It's under a millimeter thick. It's about a 32nd of an inch thick. And, um, and it's perfect. This is sign plastic. It's a, you could pick up a sign itself you don't have to go out and buy a special piece of plastic you can just buy a sign for a few pence in a hardware store or something like that that will work but the nice thing about it is it's a snap to the line uh, thing so once you cut a line you could it'll snap to that line no matter what the shape so I'm going to show you how to make that first the first thing we do when we make any um, template is we want it to be accurate and um, I've got a, a, a drawing here that I made and I'm going to use that as my reference but I'm going to come in from the edge an inch and strike a line and then I'm going to go down to the bottom of my piece of plastic an inch and mark it again that's going to mark the extreme of the radius that I'm going to be putting onto this and it gives me just a reference line to look to as I progress. My piece of plastic is four inches long and it's one and a half inches wide and my template is going to be about three quarters of an inch wide and I only need half of this um, shape because I just flip it over for the other part. So somewhere down from the top I want to leave it myself about half an inch from the top so I'm making a mark and then down from there I'm going to come three quarters of an inch and that's roughly where I'm going to start my shaping. I'm coming in from this penciled edge here three quarters of an inch and then I make a crosshair for me to put my compass on. Now I'm going to actually be using a pair of calipers here with a point on them because they will score the surface but just to get the visual first of all I'm going to go onto my crosshairs and I'm going to use a pencil I'm going to make an arc whoops that always happens doesn't it I should have made a little indent there like that and that represents the extreme of the ball that I'm going to be making. Then I'm going to come in three, I want another radius three quarters of an inch and it wants to hit the side of this but I also have a very specific dimension that I'm taking from the center line which is seven sixteenths from my center line and this crosshair is not my center line inside that I come one eighth of an inch like that that's my center line so I'm going to just eyeball parallel down the edge of this piece of plastic that short distance like that and that will be the center line of the hole that I drill down the middle of my uh, knob when I come to fit that to the plane so from that edge I want to come 7 16 from that line should I say I'm coming 7 16 and the reason for that is the neck of the knob is 7 16 
Again, I'm going to run just a, a parallel line. I'm just eyeballing it because that will be about as close as I could get it anyway, like that. So on that line is going to be the extreme of this radius. Now it's three quarters of an inch, so I move my compass until that kisses there, and then I move it up until it kisses the arc of the knob part. So there, and I just move this around until I get that center point onto both those lines. And there it is, so there is the radius I want. And a combination of this radii and this one is going to make the sweep that I want and I need my overall length of the knob is two and a half inches. So from the top of the top arc, I come down two and a half. Hang on, let me just check myself. Yep, two and a half. Which brings me to here. And that line gets squared across. So you can use your square. like that. And then of course this base part of the knob is going to be one and one eighth overall. So I want half of that which is nine sixteenths which is there. And that line gets squared up just like that. So if I cut now to the arc, whoops, if I cut to this one to this point and then I come onto this one and strike this arc, then I cut along this line and I cut along this line, that will be my overall um, sizing. But I'm actually going to cut this all the way down here because I don't need this part when I, st when I come to use it for mapping out. So, how do I get these arcs? This is what I'm going to do. I'm going to bring in the steel compass here, set it to the three quarters, and this will score the surface like this. And that actually will hopefully create my cut line. I'm going to stop where it kisses the other circle. I'm going to stop and I'm going to drop my compass into that when I go on to this one which I think is somewhere there I'm in that circle there and I make this next section of the arc just to there to that where that vertical line is then I take my ruler on the line, on that, this is the half the diameter of the foot of this template and the knob. Make a line and on that little short jag at the top there go into that score line and pull like that. Then I'm going in with my knife and I'm going to try to stay inside the groove like this. Now you've got to watch this plastic because your knife can slip on it. This is where the two points met. So I'm bringing that round into a continuous arc to that point there. Now that's my template and I want to snap, bend, 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 and bend. And there, hopefully, is my perfect template. That's the template I need, and that's going to fit the shape of the knob, and I'm going to use this as a reference all the way through shaping the knob, and it's perfect. You can keep this one too, in case you need to cut a second template, you could use this one to cut that template, but for now this is all we need.
So this corresponds to this perfectly. Well, as near as perfect as it gets, that's great. That's it, that's what we're making. One template. We are about to embark on making the front knob for a bench plane, the Stanley or the Record, uh, and it could be another make too. There were several made by different makers through the last century, but in this case, I'm working on a Stanley, uh, one of my planes over here, and I'm gonna be making the front knob for it, and my piece of wood is big enough to actually make three, but that's not the reason I've done it. It's nine inches long, it's one and five eighths of an inch square, and that's the size of the diameter, the one and five eighths is the diameter of the knob, and, um, and I can get three out of this if I want to, but that's not the reason I did it. The reason I did it is because when you're making this knob, you need to stand it in the vise and start shaping it and giving it the shape, and you need that extra length, otherwise you don't have anything to hold on to. So. That's the reason I've done it, and um, I think you'll find this a very, very interesting exercise, and it is going to be demanding, but I really think I said this in a previous part, I believe in you and I believe you can do it, and it's well worth doing. I cannot believe how wonderful my bench planes are, and I used uh, a wood called U to make these from. I'm making this one from U again. U is not the easy wood to work with, it's not easy at all, but it does make the most beautiful plane handles that I've ever, ever had. It makes them very distinctive, and when I'm gone and somebody auctions them off on eBay, hopefully they'll come for a pretty penny, because they cost me something to get to this, because I took the time to make them by hand. So, they're not generic, they're not stamped out, and what we do first of all is we want to find the center line, so we strike a line across, strike a line across. So I'm using um, a, a, a compass to give me the, the mark I need, so I set this, go on the point in the center where the crosshairs were, move this leg to the outside, and then make your line all the way around, strike your circle, and that gives you a guide. We're going to do that to this end, and we're going to do it again to the other end, and, um, and then we've got some lines to put on here that will help us to make this into an octagonal shape. And when we go from the octagonal, we'll go to 16 sides, and we'll go to 32 sides, and that way we'll minimize the, uh, the flats on the surface. We keep reducing them, reducing them, and then we go to a scraper to get a perfect round. That gives us a, uh, a long, round, thick dowel to start our shaping from. And th that will be our reference face, so we want this to be as accurate as we can get it. What I'm going to do now is I'm going to put a 45 degree across where the extreme of the circle is on each corner like this what am I doing there we go And what that does, it shows me the extreme that I can plane down to. So if I take where these octagonal lines, if I take where this hits this surface, I can then take a line like this and move it along like that, rotate it, do the same again, rotate it, do the same again, 
and the same again. Oops, splinter there. Upend it, flip it end for end and do the same from this end. Just keep rotating it. And that gives me a plane line that I can plane to. So now I've got these intersecting points. I take this corner down, this corner down, this corner down, and this corner down, and I end up with a perfect octagon as near as I need it. They're not equal sides, obviously, but this is all I need. So I'm gonna plane that down. So just lock it off in the vise, just go down in the vise about a quarter of an inch. If you've got a scrub plane, it'll work great. If you don't, just use your regular plane. So I can hog a lot off with this plane. to the line, switch planes to a smoothing plane with a finer cut. Like that. And try and keep your plane as evenly as possible and hit that line hopefully right on the arc. I have a little bit more to go to. On this end I've got it right which is often what happens when you're using a plane is it doesn't necessarily cut parallel to the surface. Keep it straight. You're going to be using this as a reference face. There, that's what I want. Flip directly over so you don't have to alter your vice setting. And the same again. I'm going against the grain now. So now I turn around, I took advantage of the grain being against me because it pulls the plane down. And I flip end for end. This is a scrub plane that I've adapted from a number four plane and it does remove material very quickly. These are my refining strokes because I want this reference face which will be a continuous surface when I finish because it, the whole of this outside will be round. There. It's close enough. Now I see, now you see the benefit of doing the two opposite faces. Now I can alter my vice. close enough because from here I'll be rounding these corners taking these facets down yet again so now I have eight sides I'll take the eight corners down that will give me 16 sides 
and I just rotate it in the vise to bring the the peak to the top and I can use my scrub plane yet again but just for a couple of strokes there three strokes will get me close to that surface but maybe more change my mind then I switch planes and take those hard corners off but I'm going to use the end grain marking as the reference for me to check my accuracy with the, the plane so I'm rotating onto the flat face and then back around to the opposite corner which I'll be removing next once I have that I check it to see I'm dead on this line I'm dead on this line what I do now just lock it in the vise and then I take the scraper this is the flexible one so it bends a lot and I pull it all the way and what that does it creates a bent round and it's cutting to the arc of the the scraper as I flex it and bend it to task so now it feels like a beautiful plain surface all the way across with no facets in it and that's what I want so I rotate and I can do two corners so I'm doing this one that I was near to a minute ago use the scrub if you feel you can and if you've got one of course if you haven't got one you don't have to convert the plane you can just convert another plane iron and drop it into the same plane and do all the coarse cuts first and then switch So now we've got a, a decent um, round shape which is what we wanted for the, the handle and you can refine it as much as you want but all I wanted was this outside reference face because it's all going to completely change and there will only be the very top of the arc uh, that I've just created that will remain in this because everything gets rounded yet more uh, at 90 degrees to this long axis so there it is simple method for getting this into a long thick dowel there nice 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 simple simple this whole thing is going to be simple because I'm going to simplify it but I think you're gonna love, love, love it. We're ready to start positioning the lines that, and we would do this on the lathe. If we were turning this on the lathe, we'd be rotating it towards us this way on the top. And um, we would put marks on there at certain points so that we would know where the cove goes and where the bead goes and then where the flat goes and we would then mark it probably with a, a parting tool or something a skew that would give us those pivotal points and we have to do that here so I'm going to be using the very end of this is actually the finished height 
So that's a difference between using the lathe and using um, uh, when you're turning between centres that is. So we're going to line up the very top of the template and we're going to make marks on the piece of wood that show the exact positions and I'm going to mark the very peak and the very bottom so I know where I'm going to be doing the scallop and where I'm going to be doing the round and that's what we do so I'm going to just mark out for one but if I was doing this and I wanted to I could actually lay out for two and I could do two exact opposites and I could start shaping those at the same time if I wanted to I don't particularly feel like that's of any benefit so I would cut one shape it get that one done take it off and then do another one separately because it's too much to do two at once I think but that's just Paul so I've got the position uh, on my piece this is the very top of the dome so this effectively fits to this like that so this is those are the positions those high spots are the ones I'm going to be marking on here so I take this and register it against the top and then just slide it in so I can get there is the bottom of the foot there is the 5 sixteenths for the foot and then in the middle of this alcove here that's showing me the position that I need to start using the rasp at some point and I'm just marking these on so you see what I'm doing but what I'm actually going to do now now I've got this position here the overall height I'm going to do something here to establish that all the way around I'm going to use a saw and I'm going to use the saw in here so I've got a square across line here this is a poor man's cutting box I'm going to put it in here and I'm going to line the markup with this and I'm going to cut it exactly a quarter of an inch deep and um, and what I'm going to do how I'm going to do that is I'm going to take a sharpie and I'm going to mark the side of the saw quarter of an inch like that because that's the depth of my cut and you watch what happens now because we're going to ro rotate that blank that's in the guide and we're going to cut down and then we're going to rotate it slightly cut again slow keep rotating it until we've gone all the way around and that will take us to a depth that we can then start removing that mid stock so watch this space it's going to be great so what i'm going to do is i'm going to rotate that mark that's this one here until it lines up with the saw cut and then i'm going to mark on my platform at the bottom and on the vertical face the exact position so that as I rotate it I keep that registration point which is this going against those two pencil lines all the way around and hopefully that will give me exactly what I want so this next bit now we're going to be cross cutting on that line that bottom base line and there's a tendency for this to want to rotate with the forward thrust of the saw and um, it doesn't really matter because ultimately we're going to be cutting all the way through this after we're done anyway so just I'm rotating it back towards me just to try it down to the line down to my line so now it's just taking maybe three strokes to get down to the line because I'm rotating it the sixteenth of a turn or something like that every time we've got to do this yet again on this blank but in a different position and I'll explain why when I've done this keep your eye on the line 
which I wasn't doing then, but I'm still dead on that line, so on the, the length line. So that by the time I've gone round, I should meet the opposite side, and I can micro adjust if I am moving off the line, which I am a little bit, it won't matter. It's not going to make any difference to this by the time it's done. In other words, it's not so critical. But of course, we strive for accuracy all the time. Now that I've said that, I went off my line just a fraction because I was talking but I'm still only half a millimetre off that line but it, it's going to be fine you'll see So there's my kiss line and I'm slightly above it but I'm more than happy with what we we got then. So that's how we do that and now I'm going to do the same again but I'm going to do it further up. So I'm going to bring you to a point on a drawing here so that you can see what I'm doing because um, if you see that then you'll understand and that's what I want. I want you to understand what I'm doing. And, and see why I'm doing it. Okay, now you'll see the benefits of having a drawing and working accurately because everything has to be cohesive, everything has to be conformed. So if I turn this so you can see it, this is the diameter of the foot. If I bring that line up until it hits the side of the body there, I've already done that on this side. There, it, There's a crosshair. And if I measure from that distance to the bottom, that will give me a distance for another line that I can do exactly what I just did when I rotated to get this seat cut at the bottom of the foot. So that's what I'm planning on doing. So actually, I measure up to that point. It's one and a quarter inches. So I'm coming up from that baseline, one and a quarter inches, and I'm going to do exactly the same, cut to that quarter of an inch depth all the way around here. And the reason I'm doing that is because then I'm going to bring in something like this, a rasp, and it just happens to fit in between in this case. If not, I will use a smaller rasp and this one is going, to, is going to cut out that waste wood in between to that quarter of an inch depth. Now, you, if you've got straight grained wood, you don't need to use this. You could use a chisel, clamp it in the vise, take it down to 3 16 rotate, take it down 3 16 keep rotating and take the bulk of the waste out. I don't trust myself with this. I might try it just so you can see it but I've got a feeling I will be up against it if I do, but because of the grain, because there is no straight grain in you. It just does not exist. Okay, so we're gonna do that now. Drop it in, make another mark, rotate it in the vise, and make another mark for you to register against. Ooh. See what I mean about it rotating when you are making those cuts? Once you've got to there, you just rotate it ever so slightly, like that, and just keep rotating it and taking those small profile cuts like that. And that's going down to an equal depth all the way around, near enough. I mean, it's obviously got flats in because you create a flat with that straight cut. I just checked myself to make sure I'm up against this line as well because I think you'll agree that that's important, especially here because this is on the underside 
of the side of the knob and if you go too deep uh, it'll be difficult to remove and look unseemly I guess is the word a little bit hard to hold because I could turn it round couldn't I and make the mark at the other end in fact I think I will Keep checking yourself. I'd forgotten I'd, I'd done this this way before. And if you push a single cut without pulling backwards, you get a better cut. Oh, the other thing, I made sure that my um, cuts in the saw box were perfectly square as well. Very, very important. There it is, parallel line, cut through to quarter of an inch deep. And now I can take out that midsection in there, whether I do it with the rasp, with the chisel. I could do it with the chisel and I might try some of it just because of efficiency and if I was I would take out the wood this way I'm going to try it and see what I think works fine I'm going with the grain though not a uh, very important not to go too deep And then come the opposite way. And look for your grain direction. That's really uh, working very well. And then you can pair cut from the side. The only thing is you don't really have a true registration surface because those saw cuts may not be quite perfect. But so we'll work that and we'll see how it goes. I'll keep working this as long as the grain is going in my favour. I'll be happy and I will keep going that way. What I'm going to do now is I'm not quite down to my line. I could, if I wanted to, go in with a router now and just bring a router into this surface dial it in send it down until it kisses that surface and then just see how I did but I don't really feel good that that is going to automatically do it so in that case what I would do is either continue with the chisel or go with the rasp and work in between those cuts to get it down. So we've got options there. Now let's take a look. If I rotate it this way, just slightly, and do the same again, take off the highs, like that. Just take out a little bit of the opposition. Like that, and then take out the midsection with pair cuts. Now, see the, the grain is changing a little bit there, but I feel good about it. I'm going to keep going as long as it's in my favor. I'll keep going. If you set your square to a quarter of an inch deep. 
you can use the outside face now to register to and you can see how deep you've gone so here I am actually down to depth and here I'm not down to depth so I'm going to go around in facets first and take this facet down to depth by chiseling carefully. So I'm looking for my grain direction and working with the grain like that. I gave you a specific size inside here. This is the part that's going at the bottom of the plane handle. And um, I gave you a specific size of one and one eighth. Now that can vary according to your plane because that's the distance that goes inside the little recess in the plane, right inside there. And that's what I'm working mine to, but yours may vary. So you'll have to make adjustments to your drawing uh, to that end. So, so now I've got to start working on that foot, which is that little section of an upstand that goes in there. And that's 5 16 from this shoulder line. So I come up from there, 5 16 up here. There's my mark and I can just pencil that around and work around that because this is where the hollow starts uh, in the stem underneath the main rounded part of the top. So that's where that starts. And this is just a question of following a line round. And you can wrap a piece of paper round if you want to, a half inch wide piece of paper and follow a line that way. I'm just going to eyeball it and see where I end up in a second when I come through to this side. And that's close enough for what I want. So that's the foot that's going to stay that diameter. And then this gets hollowed, scalloped, and it gets an even scallop from this side to this side. So I work the scallop just with a rasp or even with sandpaper, and it's only going down one eighth of an inch, so I can use a rasp, go in, 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 and then this is going to be a shoulder, and this is going to be changed, this is going to be, so I'm going to take the bulk of this out as I start hollowing this. You'll see how that happens, it's going to be really fun to see, I believe. For this next section, um, we're going to use the rasp, and it's not complicated, it's, it is quite tedious, you've got work to do. 
I found this Shinto rasp worked just fine. I've also got my small rasp and I also have a large rasp that I can use. So I may use a combination of these. But just in case, I also came up with a paddle that I've just glued abrasive paper to a half round. It's a bit about the size of a, um, a, a broom handle. So I just cut a section in two. I actually made the whole thing just by planing the half round. And that will also help me get in there if, as I need to. So whether I use it for removing the material or just for smoothing up, it will depend. But you have those options and you can also um, hope to buy a nice rasp someday, but you may not have one. So they are very, very nice when you get the really do, the good quality ones though. So I'm finished with this fellow and we're ready to do a little bit of um, shaping, quite a lot of shaping actually. But you'll enjoy it, I'm sure you will, because when you get this section and it turns out as nice as, say, one like this, you feel really pretty good about it and good about yourself too. Okay, let's do this. So how do you put this? You've got to put it in the vise. So you're gonna. I can work this sideways in my vise, like this, which actually I found very helpful, and that really works well. But you could do the uh, clamp in the vise thing and, and see how that works for you, because um, it's very variable that way. The only thing is. When you put the clamp in the vise and then you cinch this in there, you have to clamp the shoe and the, and the head in the vise at the same time and then you can't loosen one without loosening the vise. That's just a matter of choice, but I'll do some in the vise and then you can see how you feel about it. I'm sure you'll feel pretty good about it, to be honest. Okay, so I'm going to clamp this and cinch it tight and then clamp the pair in the vise just like that and this is where I go for, I'm going for this uh, small rasp because it works so nicely and it's the thickness I need, it's, a, it's an eighth of an inch thick so when I rasp down and then I get this level with the sides on here like this I know I'm already down to depth and that's going to leave me with the exact size diameter in that midsection. So this is what I'm doing and I work to that pencil line that I put on there as my guide. When I hit the pencil line, if I'm still above the surface, I move it further towards the main handle like this. There I am, I'm flush, not quite, I'm flush on either side, so I'm going to leave it at that now, and then I rotate, 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 but another thing I do now, I take the fine side of this, and I just sweep in, like this, and I can't give you an angle, but I go down until I hit that depth mark, as we did on this side. And when, that, when I hit that, it unites the two contours just like that. And then I stop because the next part is the top has to be done. So I have to now loosen, lift up as near as I can to the top like this just to get out of the way and this is where you might come a little bit unglued if you can't get enough pressure on this because now we've got to come this way and work this round just like this and I go towards that center dot that I've got in the center and so now I start to form the arch, or the arcing motion, like that. 
And then this is when this comes into play. This is the neat thing. I start to offer this to the material and, and when it hits, when it hits all the way along, I'm good to go. So now the one thing I've got to do, if you remember, I left this piece on, but this needs to come off so I can go down into the recess because I've got this here is stopping me. So I'm going to cut that off now. Once you've got close to that profile, it's just a question of rotating now. And you can rotate a lot or a little. You could rotate at 90 degrees or you could rotate at 45 degrees, whichever you want to. But the idea, of course, is to take off the bulk of the stock, like here, adjacent to that last one, and then kind of feather it in as best you can to the adjacent place. And then just keep rotating, rotating until you've got the shape you want. Uh, and you'll end up with facets, but then when we've got these facets, then we can go back in and we can take the rasp, just like this. And you can do it as you go as well if you want to. I'm looking at this shoulder line because I do want it to be even as I work around. So I'm using that pencil line as my guide. And just feather it in, start working on the shape you want for the round part. Like that. And then after a while, when you start, you feel that you have these areas blended in and not before, you don't want to do this too soon. Then we take the scraper, this thin scraper, and just pull it or push it depending on the direction of the grain. Work it in and you start working these surface fibers with this. And it, it looks like this is never going to come together. When you see this, you think this is never going to come together. But by the time you've gone round, you'll be amazed how it will look. So don't give up. I'm going to continue doing this in the vise this way. <laughs> because I like the angle and it works for me but some some of you may not have this kind of dexterity yet it's going to be something you have to see if you can I don't know why you wouldn't but I also want you to see that right in this area here I'm trying to equidistance myself from that center because we're ultimately going to be drilling a hole that receives the, um, the screw that goes on the top like this and that's going to fit in there but we can finish that later just leave it enough distance to make sure that it goes in and you have a rim around it that's all. If you're using the coarse side on this rasp, which I tend to, be careful how much pressure you put on because they're quite aggressive. I'm on the fine side now. Let's go in with the template. going to carry on all the way around like that and there's 
nothing more interesting than that. And when I get nearer to the other side, I'm going to do a bit more refining and show you how that's done. These are old um, disc, sanding discs, and uh, with the cloth back, and they stretch better on these contours than anything. They tend not to rip, and they they flex to the contour when you stretch them. is how we get that that's probably good enough for what I want for my plane handle I'm perfectly happy with that a tiny little bit of finessing And I do want to, uh, I'm just going to use the flat file on this now, just to clean up that rounded corner, give it a little bit of crispness. Continuity, really. <laughs> Little vibration there. To get around that, and if your vice is big enough, clamp it in the vice and rotate it. This uh, next step is an important step. We've got to bore the hole to receive the screw that goes on top of the rod at the fore end of the plane. That's this part here. So um, we've got to get that dead sized. And I would suggest you use a vernier caliper and then find the nearest sized bit to it. In my case, it looks like it's a dead 7 16 which would be wonderful if it was. And it is, I think. So I'm going to bore that hole and um, the reason I say check it because they do vary in size uh, surprisingly 
Um, so find out the right size and then you're good to go. Um, I've got to bore the hole and what I've got to do is first of all I don't want to put the large conical point directly in there. I'm going to drill a 1 16th hole which will allow the thread to pull itself in um, without um, it'll just reduce the risk of the wood splitting in case it does because that's quite a large diameter on that cone. I'm going to mount it in the vise this way and I'm just going to use a drill driver to pop that small hole in just to start the bit. Get it as centred as you can, it's going to go in that hole which you already have from the compasses so we'll drill that hole and then you'll be ready to drive the bit. Get this vertical in the vise, as vertical as you can, just by eyeballing. And we're going to drill right through the middle, so we've got to go through that narrow section. And you've got to watch sometimes these bits are sharpened in such a way that they really pull themselves in quite rapidly. So I'm looking this direction, and it looks good. And I'm looking this direction. and it's nicely centered it looks great so I want to go through into that bottom do I or no I, what I'm going to do I'm going to remove it before I go too deep and then I'm going to cut this off I'm going to cut this to length final length and then I'm going to drill through from the other end that way if it is slightly off it will self correct in the midsection between those two points Okay my friends, I have to admit here that I made a mistake and to correct it, would I would have to make a, a whole new um, piece. So what I'm admitting is that I shouldn't have bored that with that 5.5 millimeter bit. I should have bored it with a 9 16 bit first because I need to do a recess to, uh, there's a, um, a dimple here on the fore end of the plane that's uh, 9 16 and I should have done that one first so I'm having to plug the end of this hole now sometimes we have to do that anyway but in this case I didn't have to do it I just made extra work for myself so that if you make a mistake like that you'll know how to fix it I did it on purpose you know that so that's going to go in that hole eventually and then uh, I'll find a centre on that and it will help me to pull the bit into cut the recess to receive that, that dimple. Keep missing this corner for some reason. Could be my age. So once it goes in, just give it a good turn in there and bruise it. And so you've got a perfect size uh, 
reference point and then turn it upside down and then run that chisel along the bruised edge which will have formed a rim and the chisel just slides along that just like that what a fount of knowledge what a fount of knowledge this man has it's amazing okay when it's got tight you can glue it in there if you want to leave it and then leave it in for a few minutes so I'm going to cut that off and then I'll find the center Okay, my little faux pas has caused me an anxiety, so what I had to do is cut a slightly undersized, well it's the same size diameter but with a gap down the middle, two separate pieces of wood, so I can grip this in the vise and hopefully apply enough pressure to get me where I need to be. Funny how these little mistakes we make end up leading to so much work. But it'll be fine, I'm sure. So this will, all this does is distribute the um, pressure to the full radius of the, the knob so I can apply some pressure on this. Hopefully oh, we'll get this thing moving along the road a bit more. And that's not pulling, but at least I'm centered. Hmm, I can't quite get the angle right. I don't want to damage the work that I've already done, do I? I'm going to drill that 1 16th hole down the middle, just in case. Try again. I'm going to try a drill driver this. I mean, a, a force in a bit if I have one. Too small. And probably too big, I think. No, no, that'll work. It's a little big, but it works. See if I can get it started. There we go. I think I only have to go a short distance, I think. Thank you. And just drill that middle out. So, quite a trick, eh? Still not deep enough, but only by a little smidges. And to be honest, that's as good as it gets. So a little light sanding on there next, and um, 
I'm ready to put some finish on there. That's basically it. That's my project concluded, apart from applying some shellac. I hope you enjoyed this with me. I've enjoyed it. I, I have. I, uh, I enjoyed it. Even that last bit, I enjoyed working out how I was going to get out of it, even if I had to do the extra work. What do you think? It's nice, huh? Very nice. Feels just right. The very last detail is a couple of coats of shellac and um, that couldn't be simpler really. I hope you have enjoyed making this with me if you started. Don't give up. You saw a couple of obstacles that I self-created for myself and you saw how I resolved them and the end result is satisfaction. See there is my beautiful U photo and I'm really happy with the way it came out. I think it's very lovely. This U is stunning and if you can get some all the better. Um, it doesn't have to be U, it could be just about any wood. The very last thing I have to do is take some steel wool, make sure there's no bits in it, and buff it. And um, this will just denib the surface. And nibbing is the particles that come up in the surface through heat that bubbles in the finish from the wood, or something along that line. And it can be little particles of anything that got lodged in the finish but in this case it's, that's already down to a decent finish level now and you could simply leave it at that but I prefer just a little bit of furniture polish any soft wax will work and you don't need very much on something like this just uh, on and off really um, I apply it with the steel wool because that brings, that just seems to apply exactly the right amount. And um, that's basically it. Then you can buff it with a soft cloth or a shoe shine brush or whatever. And, uh, and the end result is a very lovely handle and a, a, plane, a plane that's just transformed into, you've customised it, I've customised it. We've got new totes on. And, um, and when you have that, and I've got um, three of my planes set up that way uh, with new handles, and, um, and I'm really happy. One of them, this middle one here, is my number four, my favourite really. And um, this one I've had uh, with new handles on for several years now. This is the rehandled one. And this is a rehandled one. So these are the most recent ones that I've just done for this video. So I hope you'll um, do the same with yours and, and have a cluster, a little cluster of planes. Um, and, and I realize that carving one of these by hand is a lot of work and a lathe is much faster. But if you don't have lathe skills, you don't have a lathe and things like that. I think probably if I started this it would take me an hour to make if I started from beginning to end. So I don't think that's prohibitive at all for me. I think it's well worth it and I think we've ended up with a very nice job. So enjoy and uh, I enjoyed doing this for you and I hope um, you'll subscribe to my YouTube channel as I always encourage you to do because the more you subscribe the more people will see this They'll validate what we're doing, trying to get people back into hand tool woodworking. And um, I think it's well worth it because I've seen a remarkable shift over the last 10 years since I've been doing this. 
online uh, to where we have hundreds of thousands of people doing this now and it's going to keep growing if we keep promoting it. Thank you very much, I've enjoyed this, it's been great.